Good evening, everyone. My name is Joseph Berger. I am the Theater Operations and Events Manager at Film Forum, an independent, not-for-profit, four-screen cinema in Manhattan's West Village, now in its 51st year. I'm speaking to you all live from my office on West Houston Street. This is yet another virtual event we are hosting while the theater is temporarily closed. So first and foremost, we wish you all health and happiness at this time. But I'm happy to announce that Film Forum is reopening this Friday, April 2nd at 25% capacity with extensive health and safety protocols in place. We are very excited to see you back at the movies. We are very proud to co-present tonight's event with New York City's Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Community Center, also known as The Center. Established in 1983 as a result of the burgeoning AIDS crisis, The Center creates and delivers services that empower people to lead healthy and successful lives. The Center continues to serve the LGBTQ community through virtual support launched immediately after the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Welcome to all the center's guests and members tonight. And to learn more about the center, please visit gaycenter.org. Um, I'd love to take a moment to welcome our guest moderator to the uh, Q&A. Leo Herrera is a Mexican Hello. writer. Hi, Leo. Leo <laughs> is a Mexican writer, activist, and filmmaker whose work focuses on the American queer experience. Leo is the director of Fathers, a sci-fi documentary and multimedia project which imagines the AIDS pandemic never existed and a generation lived to change the world. Fathers is streaming now at ifthelived.org. Leo's viral essay memes explore queerness, race, COVID and HIV stigma and can be found on Instagram at Herrera Images. Hi, Leo. Hi. Thank you for having me, and hello from a very hot New Orleans. Uh, it's not so hot here in New York, <laughs> uh, but I am so thrilled that you're here with us and uh, really excited to, to, to hear you talk about this film. Uh, tonight's discussion is on Wojnarowicz, Fuck You, Faggot Fucker, the acclaimed new documentary by Chris McKim that explores the life, work, and legacy of visionary queer artist and activist David Wojnarowicz via a dynamic collage of clips, images, interviews, and many recordings of David's own voice. Film Forum is thrilled to present this on our virtual cinema platform at filmforum.org. With that, I'd love to welcome our first guest, the editor of Wojnarowicz, Dave Stanky. Come on in, Dave. Hi, Dave. Hey, how are you? Dave has been editing documentary and reality television for over 20 years, beginning with multiple seasons of MTV's The Real World and other projects, including MTV's Making the Band, and NBC's Average Joe, and Fox's The Simple Life. Recently, he co-edited the Emmy-winning documentary Out of Iraq, as well as Frida Got a Gun. Dave is currently lead editor on Bravo's The Real Housewives of Salt Lake City, and he's zooming in from Los Angeles. Hi, Dave. Hi, how are you? I'm very good. Thanks for being with us tonight. And finally, the guest of honor, our uh, filmmaker of Wojnarowicz, Chris McKim. Come on in, Chris. Chris is an Emmy-winning documentary filmmaker and TV producer, starting his career at Miramax Films. Uh, he once hit Harvey Weinstein in the head with a door. He helped create the hit series RuPaul's Drag Race as showrunner and executive producer of the first four seasons. In 2016, he co-directed and produced the aforementioned Emmy-winning documentary Out of Iraq, and most recently directed and produced Frida Got a Gun, which was selected for the 2020 Tribeca Film Festival. Hi, Chris. Hello, thank you for having me. Uh, very, very happy to have you here. So I'm gonna leave the three of you guys to talk about this film. I can't wait to hear about it, and I'll see you all in about 45 minutes. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. I think we're alone now, guys. <laughs> um, um, Dave, Chris, first of all, congratulations. Uh, I waited till the very last possible second to watch the film. So I watched it last night and I, it's, I mean, David is such an incredible subject and I was a little bit more than nervous to watch it, but this is where I gush. It was so beautiful. And for folks that have not seen it yet, I, as soon as you get off this, this Q and A, it's, Chris, it feels like David's work the collage elements of it are so stunning and the editing was just incredible. It was so seamless and, and it felt like such a fever dream. Um, 
I watched it with a friend who never heard of David before. And by the end of it, we were complete messes on the couch, just like <laughs> ugly crying while the cats are sitting there wondering what's going on. Um, he wasn't familiar with David's work or he wasn't familiar who David was, but he was familiar with the work. So when we were sitting there, I was like, have you seen the image of the back of the jacket that says, if I die, throw my, my body on the steps of the FDA. And it really got me thinking about how David was one of our original meme artists. And so much of his work is in, in that format that we still use now. And so much of the artists of that generation were so media savvy. And so, you know, used iconography so much. And David, documented himself endlessly it seems like he is the main narrator of this film which as a documentary filmmaker that's like it's gold so my first question to you is I really wanted to know um what hit the cutting room floor that really broke your heart and that you might have just held on to the last possible minute and that's for both of you um, uh, I'll dive in. Well, I'm gl I'm glad you liked it. It would have been awful if you hated it after. Uh, <laughs> oh, I know. I know. Committing that. to. Uh, <laughs> that would <have> been very <laughs> awkward. <laughs> I would have lied. <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, I mean, there were so many amazing things in in the archive. I mean, just from the tape journals alone. Um. You know, David had so many great things to say. The one thing about editing this is that. Um, it was a pretty disciplined edit, I think, because we were covering all the audio and it really took a lot of work. And any section, because we couldn't, didn't have the luxury of like looking at the interviewees, um, you know, I would hand over Dave a piece of, you know, I, I would sort of like cut together the audio and hand it over to Dave and he'd be like, well, what are we going to put on it? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> um, so, you know, in, in terms of things on, on the cutting room floor, it's, um, you know, every gem that came out of David's mouth for sure. Um, you know, I always thought there'd be more sex. I mean, there's plenty of it for sure. Or, so, you know, sort of like talk about things in the seventies or, or whatnot. But um, I thought there'd be more of that over the course of the project. Yeah, that was like one of the things that we did cut that was really fun was David going out one night with his friends and ending up in the basement of that. Oh, where was it? I forget the name of the club he went to. The Anvil. The Anvil. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that was a really fun sequence put together just because it wasn't, it wasn't sad yet. It was still like young David in New York. Yeah. You know, out and about. And, um, and we had, and you know, cause he had so many, like Chris said, like he left behind so many great audio cassettes of just him talking about that night and what that was like. And, and, you know, like, <laughs> whether whatever happened in the basement of the Anvil is what it is, but, you know, we all have those, those <laughs> the prayer circle. Right, exactly. It was like, <laughs> like fun wild nights out with your friends. And there was elements of that. And it was just kind of like, again, it was just like a fun thing. Um, that, that was one of the things that I think hit the floor that we, we lost. And of course, so why did you, uh, why did you choose to, to edit that out? Well, for one, I think it was just a, a music issue. Like we had cut it with, a, we had cut it with, um, Tainted Love, I believe, was the cue, and and oh, it just, wow. you know, it didn't. I, I like, you know, we didn't have the money for that, and so I think without without a, a fun music cue like that, it doesn't really work. But um, and it also was just a. Uh, I think another reason was it just kind of was one of those things where just a lot of things we cut would just sort of got in the way as we started looking at the whole um, the whole structure of, the, of how the film was going to work. It. Um, something just became obvious, like, well, it was nice, but we don't really need this. Right. And I think, you know, when you start watching it, and for folks who haven't seen it, there's no talking heads, which for documentary filmmakers, you sort of, you can use that as a bit of a crutch when you can be like, oh, they can just ramble on for another minute and a half. But it's it's montage and, and sequences throughout the entire thing. So was that a... I mean, and as a documentary filmmaker, I also understand that it's easier to to interview people audio only and and cheaper. What was the uh, what was the reason behind that choice to do audio only interviews? Um, it was really about bringing David to life. I mean, I think the fact that he lived and breathed on all this archive that came from Fales Library at NYU, it, there was an opportunity to like really have him come to life for the audience. The fact that we weren't cutting to people 30 and 40 years after they knew David throughout so that you saw, you know, uh, just, you know, how, how people age. And, and, and you know, a lot of, it's, 
a lot of times documentaries like this are as much about the people and the period now, you know, it's sort of their memories and, and, and sort mm -hmm. of um, how they're looking back on it. But, you know, with this, there was, as you said, there's sort of a real opportunity to just kind of make this insular world so that even before I knew just how amazing the audio would be at the archive. I knew that it existed, um, but I thought between whatever there might be there in David's writing and essays and journals that, you know, we could still do that. And as the audio started coming in and we heard how much David had to say, we sort of just abandoned the aspect of trying to, you know, sort of incorporate his writing as, as a sort of transcript thing, sort of in the way they did um, I'm Not Your Negro, where they had, you know, yeah. all that incredible footage of James Baldwin, but then they had you know, Samuel L. Jackson voicing all the writing that they incorporated as well. And that's a really good point because you do really create that world of, of that time. And I think so many of us romanticize that time in New York, but it was really dirty and scary. And, and, you know, when you read these biographies, a lot of it's like, my TV was basically always borrowed because it was going to get stolen at any time. And there's the moment where you show, uh, Peter's photographs and that montage and you get to see everybody so young and my friend audibly gasped when he saw Fran Lebowitz that photo oh, of her in the bed <laughs> <laughs> and she looks all sexy and beautiful and you're just like yeah this is they're sort of the age that we were um so the title's fuck you faggot fucker and for people who haven't seen the film that is there's a hilarious story behind that which is a, a the title of one of David's pieces and he is completely uncompromising it and uncompromising and calling that piece that name. And one of the things that's interesting when you work with uh, heroes that you have and you're creating media about them is that you have to sort of take their, their world views into consideration when you're creating the piece. When I was doing Fathers, I did an episode on Robert Maplethorpe and I ended up, even though I, I, I fought it as much as possible, I ended up with a sexually explicit scene of fisting in New York. And I went back and forth about whether or not to use it, but it's like, how can you not use a fisting scene if you're paying homage to Robert Maplethorpe's work? Um, but it's, you know, it's terrible for the press and it's terrible for social media, but I felt like that decision that you made for that title was obviously an homage to him. So what other things did you have to be totally uncompromising about either at the beginning of it or, or at the end that you knew this is something that we have to stick our stick to our guns about because you're, you're honoring David. I think for me, well, I would just say for me really quickly would be, you know, David was a very um, in your face type of person. So just like right out the gate for me coming in and I only knew David, I, I knew some of David's work. Like when Chris first was telling me about this project, I only, I, I knew about, you know, obviously I knew the U2, um, album cover the single cover I knew the burning house but like when you really like in those early days like just right out the gate like getting to like listening to David like a lot of it is especially when you're at first listen it's like oh well that's that's a bold that's a bold and in your face statement so like that kind of stuff like hit me right away yeah, for sure. And, you know, it's uh, a little bit of a David rant goes a long way. So I think that was one of the things we uh, struggled with along the way as well, because, you know, there, there are so many things um, like the One Tribe Nation, you know, sort of like when he, he goes on that little riff in the film, there's so many little things that like after a while, it just seemed like, oh, my God, is this is David just going to yell at us for... <laughs> 60 minutes, you know, which is fine. I mean, yeah. it, it really is supposed to be like you're, you've spent the day with him. So that would make sense. Yeah. But, like, um, yeah like after a while, like it's like one yelling montage after the next, that's where we discovered like those answering machine tapes that he left behind. Like those are such wonderful little slice of life things. And those things were loaded with comedy and like going back to like an earlier thing you asked cutting room floor stuff, you know, Peter Hujar left him so many wonderful, uh, funny and charming and just like kind of thing. Like nowadays would be the thing that we would text each other. But like in those days, you know, he was just calling to check in with David and to see what he was up to that day. And, and there was a, quite a few of them that we tried to use. But, you know, again, you can, there's only so many slots to put that kind of stuff. That's what the end credits were for, to squeeze in a couple more. Yeah. And I love the answering machine part because you realize you're working in this totally analog world at the time. And that's how, like, there's no way to talk to your friends or to check in. And some of those slice of life moments were so beautiful. And you realize like, this is, 
the way that they're communicating at the time is so different than what we have. So it makes his work even more impactful because you could go out and put a smoke signal or a, a piece of graffiti to let somebody know something. Um, so the other, you know, I call this kind of work ancestor work because you're, you're digging up an ancestor and you're, you're figuring out what their lives are and the minutia of their lives. And, and you sort of live with them for a really long time. Uh, how long did you spend li- basically and this goes for both of you. How long did you spend listening to him in your headphones or in your in your head? You started the production when and 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 locked when? Um, well, you know, I probably got the first set of um, tapes, and each, you know, I got all these files from Fail's library, and each file was um, one side of an audio cassette, so probably thirty to forty five minutes, depending on the type of tape he would use. Um, and I st- so I started listening to them October or November 2017, um, and in some ways didn't stop until uh, March 13th when everything shut 2020 when everything shut down, and then it kind of <laughs> went away. <laughs> you know, it was like I, I kind of like after a while I was joking that I lost David Wojnarowicz to the COVID pandemic, Aww. you know, because it was really like he had been, you know, it had been this constant thing for. Um, well, for me, almost uh, two, two and a half years. We didn't start editing though till like I think March, or I'm sorry, uh, May twentieth, twenty nineteen. So it was like I think eight or nine months of editing all together with some breaks and whatnot in there. And did you have any kind of like process to sort of sit down at least in the beginning? Because it's, it, I mean, it must have been such a fucking Mount Everest to climb, but just the level of of content that he has did you have a personal process that you went through when you sat there to to put him inside your head um i actually tried to make it more chaotic like i've loaded of course we you know we put in the avid and i was pulling uh you know selects and stuff but i just loaded it up on my iphone and i would shuffle them so oh wow yeah so it was like you know i might spend you know 30 minutes in 1981 with him and then suddenly hear answering machine tapes because there was there was not a some of the tapes were labeled and there was some idea of what the time period might be, but really didn't know what, what was on them. And as I got deeper into it, I realized that some things weren't quite what they seemed like they might be um, or had been, had been labeled as. Um, so I just, I, I really just tried to kind of like soak it up that way. And, and the, the, the real kind of discipline was just trying and keeping track of what the archive was um, beyond the actual content, um, you know, like the, the images and, um, dates and times and like where something, as I was discovering things, sort of typing things in, or, you know, we, there's an AP who worked on it as well, who was going through all the answering machine tapes and we would just mark everything because we didn't even transcribe David's tapes. So for like that two years, it was a lot of like hoping to find a marker or like the keyword was the thing that I thought it was, or, oh. um, <laughs> There were, I mean, (laughs) there were so many times I would, you know, I spent weeks like trying to find something that I knew would be somewhere. And I'm like, where's that fucking audio? Like where I know at some point he said this, but couldn't find it. Yeah, I think. And Dave, how was your organization for that? I was, you know, when I, I parachuted in behind Chris and Chris was so far ahead of me that for like the first couple of months, he would come in and just sort of like, just talk. And (laughs) I found this long enough that I just be like, I just had my notepad and I would just like write down things and some of it, I'd be like, I don't know what he's talking about. And then there'd be other things would be like, Oh yeah, that sounds great. And then just again, Chris's process, it kind of made sense too, because there was, it, it was overwhelming. Like, because like, you know, you had, you had his, the, like the audio cassettes alone, you know, there's no visual references except for just occasional little like avid locators that Chris might've dropped on there. So you know, it, it was really overwhelming, unlike, you know, a lot of like stuff we work on now where it's quite obvious you can just scrub through a video clip and find what you're looking for. Um, so I think in terms of like process, Chris began with like he you you kind of knew Chris, like there were certain things that were just gonna be in it, in the in the final. And so we kind of started, we we really edited quite a bit out of order. Like we, um, yeah. we like whatever, like like so like one of the first things I think I worked on was what like the beginning of the movie obviously honestly we we kind of worked on last because like the peter hujar story was probably one of the first things i truly started to like figure out how we're gonna edit like what our style was what chris was into and how we're gonna like try to mimic david um and use david's you know david's um 
film and, and photographs and art and how we're going to do this. And Peter's story from beginning, middle and end was sort of a self-contained thing. So like I kind of worked on that for a while while Chris was kind of thinking about other stuff and he would just come in and say what he liked and what he did. And, and that's kind of what, and then, you know, by the time I finished with Peter, then we just sort of parked that for a while. And then like Chris would just hand me another chunk of time. I and mean, I think it was, that was probably like what New York city was like, you know, in the pre, you know, in the, in the old, in the old days, um, the pre Giuliani, you know, the pre clean New York. So like I worked on that for a while because Carl, uh, you know, uh, he had interviewed Carl McCormick who left, who was really wonderful. just had all sorts of great things to say about New York as of course, Fran Leibovitz. So you know, that was just kind of fun. Just like, putting that together and using David's archive, plus filling in what David didn't have. Um, we were, you know, they, they are a, a story assistant would, you know, was finding clips, you know, from Getty Images or, or a network, you know, NBC or CBS or places like that. And we were just kind of like filling in what David didn't have just to create that vibe, create that scene and, and create those atmospheres. Yeah. Well, I was going to say too, one of the things, you know, David's audio, I think sort of, uh, filter down to like four or five different topics. There was like the tape journals, the answering machine tapes, um, something that I called production audio. So it might be things that he would either incorporate into the band's music or, you know, it was just sound effects or whatever it might be, or street recordings. And then like one other thing, and we ended up color coding all those sections. Mm. So it got to the point where we could just look at the timeline and be like, oh, there's, you know, phone messages were yellow. So we usually knew that was like the beginning uh, or end of a section. So that wasn't actually really helpful. That was the, kind of the best part of uh, the organization. And you can actually see with colors how, the, yeah. I mean, it's difficult for people who don't edit, but you need every piece of help you can get when you're in that process. So a color coding thing sounds like a great way to get yeah. the emotional cues. And especially because of David, um, you know, his work was so layered. And then Chris, it was a great idea and we just went with it, it was you know we everything we did was very layered too to kind of like match david's archive and david's art and so yeah it was like the timeline you know the added timeline when you're looking at sort of like on the screen like what the movie is there's a lot of video there was lots of layers of video and lots of layers of audio so it got complicated it got complicated <laughs> <laughs> and once you make that choice and go down that road simple shots stop working like everything sort of becomes yep the fact to keep the keep the pace going it's a tapestry so you have to you can't just have a shot of a of a of a i, I remember a couple of shots that i was like these and <laughs> these mother effers like did so much layering that this must have taken forever uh one of the things that i really loved was how you brought this beautiful relationship between Peter and David to life. And, you know, as, as queer folks, we don't see ourselves represented in different kinds of relationships so much, um, like the variety. And I love when Fran uh, Leibowitz talks about how he was sort of his daddy, you know, his art daddy. And me and my, my friend are watching. He's like, I know exactly what she's talking about. <laughs> like we have those kinds of, um, did you sort of discover that relationship as, and this is sort of a larger question of how much you knew about David's life, but centering it on his relationship with Peter, did you know how much of a symbiotic mentor relationship they had before you started working on this? Well, you know, there's, um, Cynthia Carr has written, there's a, a pretty detailed biography about David called Fire in the Belly, which um, I hadn't read when I first reached out to uh the uh, PPOW, which is manages his estate, but then read it, you know, over the course of the next like six weeks before I went to New York to meet them. And that really covered um, mm. a lot of, you know, pretty much every relationship David ever had. And like the, his universe was so huge because he had so many collaborators and all that. So um, that was in there. What I didn't know was how we would tell that story. And that, again, that was like, one of those amazing discoveries on the answering machine tapes that like we could just bring Peter to life just through, you know, the, the, the tapes. And I think what I didn't know, uh, you know, everyone was afraid of Peter in the way they were afraid of David <laughs> back in the day. So that's all I ever heard until I heard the tapes. And then you hear the tapes and he's like this goofy, like, you know, kind of level. And I'm sure he was very frightening. for What was it? Things. What were people afraid of? Um, you know, I think he, he was, uh, you know, he could just be bitchy. <laughs> I, think <laughs> read the shit out of I think he was angry. Yeah. Well, but, you know, I think in the, in the way that David, you know, had very strong opinions and could have a temper, I think 
Peter did as well, you know, and a lot of friends too, um, of course. But um, I just, I didn't know how we would, how we would tell that story and to hear him sort of on those tapes and hear elements of their relationship, almost like sort of like in, in, you know, when they find the insects in the amber, it's like just these little bits from, from their daily lives in there that were um, just so intriguing and so illuminating um, that really, I mean, without those tapes, we would have been screwed. And even David's sister, um, Pat is only in through those tapes as well. And, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because her, her story, their, their relationship in the course of the film, you know, there's a, there, there's a lot of emotion and, and stuff, I think, to her calls, um, different than Peter's for sure. But, um, the, the way that everything comes across and just those, you know, little 30 second messages. It's beautiful. Yeah, there's that familial shorthand, you know, between like, you could, yes. talk, you could talk about the relationship between David and his sister forever, but like just the way she says things in her voice, like the thing that always cracked Chris and I up when we were watching was, you know, when she's leaving in the message about how she was, went to saw his, you know, went to see his work in the museum. She wanted to take a photo, but you know, they didn't want to use the flash. And I could just only imagine like the giant flash that, you know, she probably had like <laughs> cute or something, you know. And back to your thing about too, like bringing Peter to life, you know, it's a piece of advice that was great that was given to me a long time ago when I was first starting out. I was editing on Real World. And one of the editors, longtime editors on that show told me when I was up and coming that he's like, you know, a, a piece of video is great, but if a piece, because, but a piece of audio is something that's even more valuable because you can always cover, you can always mm -hmm. find a picture of something or a video of something. But like hearing someone's voice delivering something with emotion, you can't, that's not something you can like recreate. You know, I mean, you, the way her voice cracks when she asks him how he's doing and you can literally hear that weight of, of his impending death coming. There's no, there, there's, there's no video that could have. Yeah. And even like the answer machine tape when Gracie calls um, David, but he's living at Peter's house and because she called Peter's number. You oh, know, yes. Realized, <laughs> oh my God. You know, <laughs> devastating. with us and you can just hear. And again, it's a great thing. You can talk about it all day long, but you just hear that crack in her voice and it's, it's great. It's really just like a punch, but it's, it works really well. And so, um, I mean, it's a love story. So much of it's a love story between these two artists that I, that was really unexpected for me, even though I sort of knew their story. And, you know, that moment that you realize that he quit doing hair, that somebody was so important to him that he stopped doing heroin. And it makes sense. And I've heard that story before, but I'd forgotten about it. And as I was watching it, I'm so in the moment. And then you sort of realize here comes the plague and all of this is going to be gone. But this is so important that he was able to save his life by giving him an ultimatum with friendship, which I thought was so incredible. Um, which brings me to something that as I was watching it and, you know, having worked with so much also documentary material, um, like ancestry work does take its toll on you on emotionally. And by the time that you get to this beautiful storyline and by the time that Peter spoiler alert dies, um, it's absolutely devastating. And you let it play out so simply and so beautifully. And, and it's just, I couldn't even look over at my friend cause I knew that we were both ugly crying, trying to be really, really quiet, you know? Um, but you have to watch these clips over and over again. Right. And that sort of takes its toll on you. So I wanted to know like, what were the, what took the most emotional toll for you? Um, you know, there's a theme that I think when all of us do these pieces based on these other heroes that we have is that a lot of us tend to be the age that they were when they died. So you have this sort of sense of, I mean, you can't think about your mortality when you're working with some with a figure like this. So what was, for each of you, what were the pieces or moments that took the most out of you, that the, the, the emotional peaks or emotional valleys? Um, well, you know, I... Again, I keep going back to the, just the experience of listening to all the tapes because it was sort of like trying to figure out what David's journey was, but as he saw it, you know, it's like we we knew the milestones as I said read the book, and you know there are countless articles about him in the essays, but it was really 
hearing what his sort of daily struggle was like, the, you know, in, when he was 26 and trying to figure out what he was doing with his life. Like it was the little relatable things more, I think, than, um, you know, what would necessarily seem like the darkest parts um, that I think had the most, because they were the most unexpected, you know, they were the things that, that, that really sort of like bore into my mind. And it's like, you know, when you're, it, it's hard to not be, uh, you know, a gay of a certain age working on a project like this and, uh, and, and trying to piece together somebody else's life. And it was the first project that I've done um, with somebody who was no longer alive in this way. There was a full mm-hmm. biography, um, uh, and you, you knew the end and everything. So there was just something about like, you know, David accomplished so much and did so much and, you know, all of these things. And, you know, as I'm listening to him at 26, wondering what he's doing with his life here, I am in like, uh, older, uh, I'm like, what the <laughs> hell am I doing? You know, do we ever know? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Dave, what about you? What's some footage or or emotional cues that you put together that that took the most toll out of you? I think for yeah, I think I think Chris hits on some of that for me as well. Um, for me, I think something that really jumped out at me was watching like you know I watched a lot of material from David, but also I I also just watched a lot of archival material from Getty and and CBS mm-hmm. and through other places we were using. Um, a lot of which we didn't end up needing, but I had to watch a lot of it just looking for those little things. And, and, you know, as an, you know, it's kind of watching now in, you know, 20, you know, 2019, 2020 was, you know, like watching those act up meetings and watching, Mm -hmm. watching those people, you know, in a protest, watching David at those protests at the FDA, um, a piece of video I stumbled across that we didn't use in the movie, but I think it's, it's kind of known is, you know, there was that, I believe it was a White House press briefing where somebody asked the press mm-hmm. secretary. Reagan. Yeah. And, and, and everybody just kind of laughed or just was sort of indifferent. And I thought, you know, that to me, especially living how we live now, it's like, wow, that's a difference. Because the one thing that also jumped out at me, because like, you know, I kind of fell in love with Peter a little bit too, like just editing him, like, because he was you know, I can be rather surly as well. So, he, you know, there was a lot of like, just listening to him and his, what, you know, what he was into. I was like, yeah, I might, I might have a lot of your, the same feelings you have. Um, and, and when Fran tells that powerful story about him getting that diagnosis, that for me was like, oh, wow. Like just to have the rug ripped out from under you and then you're going to be gone, you know, 11 months later. And then driving to and from work though, listening to like top 40 LA radio out here, you know, you'll hear an ad on a top 40 modern rock station for, you know, medication to manage your HIV. Mm -hmm. That was, I never really paid attention to that commercial because I, you know, I don't have to, but like, but hearing, I never, hearing that ad in context of then going to work and editing something where they're out, these, these guys are out of time. And these, and the ladies that unfortunately also contract, they're also out of time. And so like, I found that to be really, there was a few days of that where I was like, this is, Right. It's interesting how the callousness of that time floats to the top. Can you tell our audience about that? Because I know which clip you're talking about when somebody asks Reagan's press secretary, but can you relay what that clip is? I, I, you know, I, it's been a while. So I, I just remember, the, the, I vaguely remember what I saw, but it was just the question I believe was asked about, about th- that there's this disease going around affecting gay men, I believe is how the question mm-hmm. was maybe paraphrasing. And it was just sort of a, it was just sort of a laughter and indifference. It's just yeah. The, the press secretary, I just saw the clip not that long ago doing the COVID stuff, but the, they asked the press secretary about this, and he basically says uh, like something like, "Are you a fruit?" or something yeah. like that. And then they all laugh in the room, and you sort of see the direct line between that and how Trump handled. And so it's it's really, I don't know, it's kind of overwhelming. Um, which brings me to sort of my final question since we had about 30, 35 minutes. So if anybody in the audience wants to uh, chime in with your questions, um, please let me know. Um, so this is our second pandemic and any gay man of a certain age understands that on a very, very personal level. Um, and watching the, the necropolitics of AIDS take hold and watching David 
David's, you know, so much about when you watch these sort of documentaries or these movies, it tends to be happy, happy, happy. And then the third act is, is very expected. Um, one of the things I did really love is how you folded that, the, uh, the early diagnosis of other people into it and sort of you sort of see the world around David close in on him until AIDS and this, this other pandemic is permeating literally everything that he's doing. And in the film, you have a great a moment where they want him to be quiet because, again, the callousness of an era always flows to the top. So one of the things that you never hear about much is what it must have been like for these artists that were already famous. They get these diagnoses. Everybody knows they're going to die. And you touch upon this. And, and it was one of the most heartbreaking moments for me. Um, you realize how hard it must have been for someone like Keith Haring to have people buy his work and to be so cruel with that. Um, so you finish this movie, another pandemic hits, a lot of the same themes, a lot of the same people are being hurt by it. Um, how do you view the film? How do you view David through the lens of what you've gone through the last year? Um, well, you know, it was, it was interesting to see everything you know, because we thought the film was going to come out last April and we were really making, I mean, I was making the film. My, my goal was, and, and then I just co co-opted every one into it was like trying to like have it ready for the election. It was about getting people galvanized mm. for the election so that when Tribeca went away and suddenly everything stopped and, you know, we know, no idea what's going on in our lives, you know, especially that first three months where we're all locked up and like, no idea what's happening. Um, it was interesting to see all the bits of David's life and things that he talked about and things that um, we unknowingly put in the film that kind of spoke to what was happening. And part of it was the pandemic. Part of it was Trump being even more Trump than he was when we started, you know, or when we walked away. Um, and so that, I mean, that part, that's sort of... Um, uh, circular nature, uh, cyclical, that's the word that I'm looking for. Nature of everything um, really, I think, came came forward for sure. And the way that, um, you know, David, something we didn't include in the film, but it's part of David's speech at Normal, um, Illinois, where we have the words come on screen as, as he's speaking at that retrospective. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he talks about, you know, uh, money not going to, to HIV, you know, medications and, and information and all that stuff. And he asks, you know, um, you know, if, if this was something that hit closer to home, would people be, you know, would funds go to it? If it was something that affected the president of the United States or what, you know, and it just didn't go in because the, I mean, he spoke for 45 minutes and it was kind of like, off track. And if there was anything that I would have put in after this last year, I think it would have been that because the fact is mm -hmm. it did affect everyone. You know, there, there, there wasn't anyone that either through direct contact or friends or whatever it might be, it was unaffected by this. And yet uh, it still didn't matter to the government. It didn't matter to, you know, any, so it's like to see, to see something like that affect the entire population and then realize that, oh, it, it's still just as expendable as when it was just, you know, just a bunch of homosexuals in, in the cities or whatever it might be to these people, um, I think was really stunning, you know? And I also really appreciated that you put the the data, you know, I think at one point you talked about how babies were more likely if they were Hispanic or, or black to, to have, you know, to die of AIDS and that whole sequence about him realizing that they're doing these placebo tests on children. And I mean, that stuff, when you look at it in the way that COVID has been treated by the government, it's, it's so relevant. What about you, Dave? How do you view your work now through the lens of, of having experienced this? I, you know, I think, you know, across the whole thing, it was like history repeats itself, you know, and, and David, for better and for worse, you know, and, and the stuff that David was mad about, you could still unfortunately be mad about today. And, you know, and that goes right from the beginning when, you know, Ronald Reagan said, let's make America great again to, oh. and, you know, it's just kind of, and then Chris pointed something out to me when we met about a week ago about, you know, David talks about, you know, 
if he, if, when he had not enough to lose, you know, he wouldn't maybe like type, you know, go to the Capitol building and, you know, start a riot and, you know, look what happened. So yeah. there's yeah. round and round we go and hopefully just, it gets better incrementally, but same, you know, same problems. Um, two last ones. Uh, what, you know, my, my project father's imagines what the world would look like if we didn't lose an entire generation. Right. And then when you watch a film like this, you realize how intertwined AIDS became with, with where we are now. Um, what do you think David would have done in, in 2021? What would you think he'd be doing right now? And, uh, he seemed to be so, um, against the, the larger capitalistic elements of it. And, uh, as a side question, I, I wanted to know that sequence where he brings all the trash to those rich people's house <laughs> is one of my favorites. You realize he has such a playful, hilarious sense of humor. Um, uh, where did you get that footage of like the really gross streets of, of the East Village? <laughs> those are those are David's. Those are David's. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> yeah. He loved a junkyard. He loved, you know, ruins. He loved the piers and warehouse. Anything that, you know, uh, yeah, Anything I was think in- it was kind of festering. <laughs> um, so one of the questions that I have here is, you know, contemporary queer aesthetic making and video. Um, are you both familiar with the little Nas thing that just happened? I mean, if I you, right. Um, and you realize that so much of David's anger and fury is, is still sort of being channeled and, and every gay man sort and every queer person um deals with this moment where they they realize that they're they're carrying this um what do you think um what do you think that he would be doing artistically right now i mean i i think i think that's hard to say <laughs> i think what, what I mean, if you if it, i mean it's it's only your thought about what you maybe right. wish he would be doing is a better is a better way to frame that well, I mean, I, you know, I think David's art career was relatively short, you know, it's like, um, he pro he, he finished creating around 1990, 91. And so it was like a decade or so that a little more that he, you know, this self-taught guy sort of dove in, he would use whatever sort of technology technology being you know the xerox machine or whatever Mm -hmm. would come up and sort of really taught himself and you know through his collaborations all these amazing techniques and and ways of further expressing himself and seeing where he went in that first you know decade plus imagining where he would have gone 30 years later i think is you know i think i think he would be doing an incredible amount of stuff and the fact that technology changed so much right after you know like in the in the few years after he passed away mm-hmm. um you know i think he would be making the most of all of that as we all are you know as technology you know gets cheaper he'd be running around recording and shooting stuff on his iphone i'm sure and like that would be the, the whole thing and probably editing it and throwing it up you know i mean yeah i mean one thing i noticed immediately i, I said it to chris too is just yeah he was like you know in an analog world he was already like an instagrammer in a way like all you know from taking selfies of himself in the mirror to just documenting everything, you know, talking to himself, writing like, you know, his, those audio cassettes, you know, those are like how people document their life now on social media. I think he would have probably used a lot of, it's a good chance that he would use a lot of these things to his advantage. And he'd probably get a kick out of knowing that his jacket message ended up on a meme that my friend already knew about. And so it's just so fast. I would love to see him take on the Trump era. You know, that would have been such an incredible thing to see. Um, so I've got some other audience questions here. Um, is there any plan to release the three, three teens kill Four music? Um, well, there is a soundtrack and it's available on iTunes. Um, there we go. Bornerovich, fuck you faggot fucker with, uh, music by three teens kill four and, uh, some audio, some of David's audio from the film and, and other little gems. So. Oh, wonderful. As Rue would say, available on iTunes. <laughs> Um, let's see. Okay, we already covered that one. Let's see. Uh, in Cynthia uh, Carr's book, she writes about David and Peter's first meeting. Did you come across any references to when David first became aware of Peter's work before they met? Um, 
No, I did not. I, I'm aware of it in the from the book where I think it was somewhere late uh, 1980 is, is when they sort of first um, sort of crossed paths. And, and P, David was aware of his work, like the photos and stuff, but I had not seen any sort of mention um, that I recall. Um, yeah. And you know what I want to add too, because we, you were asking about like things that kind of uh, hit us emotionally. I would say, you know, one of the things that I found really late in our editing process was that David had recorded that his half of the conversation with his brother. Now I knew yeah, about, I that call. about that. I knew about the call from the book and I, you know, had interviewed Stephen. um, well, it would have been two years ago this week, uh, his brother, Stephen Bornerovich. And, you know, he, he he talked about that. And we were for, I mean, we were, it was like the fall of 2019, I think. So we were several months into editing when I stumbled across, you know, David yelling in a way that I hadn't heard before. Wow. And realized that it was that conversation. And, you know, hearing another relatable thing, you know, in terms of, um, being gay and, and, you know, understanding what, you know, people went through during the AIDS crisis and talking to their families and all that stuff and all that raw emotion that comes out in his, his voice, um, I think is, is, is really powerful. Um, and the interesting thing was too, that, you know, he's, there's that point where, uh, Stephen says, you know, uh, makes the comment about, he said something about having a faggot for a brother. And mm -hmm. David said, I didn't say that. Well, he actually didn't say like that. Act, those two things sound like a, like a trick of editing, you know, like, but uh, that is what Steven said. And David didn't never say, <laughs> didn't actually put it. So it was like across time, they were still having this, this conversation. Wow. That was really like, um, yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, I, I could see where, in a non-literal sense, everything that David was probably saying on that phone did sound to to a straight brother in the eighties as like faggot for a brother. <laughs> you know that that probably he probably just that's always been the, the his sort of memory of that conversation, um, and that to me was very creepy. Not not the not Stephen's reaction, but just that moment when that mm -hmm. kind of happened, and it was like, oh, they're still having this conversation. Yeah, and it's it, it was one of the parts in the film that I was really uncomfortable because it's so it's it feels so private, but it's so it's also so universal. There was so many of those conversations going on during that time, but to actually hear somebody have that and then to only hear one side of it literally was just <laughs> it's still kind of I mean I just watched it last night on purpose so I could still have emotional responses to it but that's one of those moments that's really really intense uh, I think we have time for one more question let's see um talking about how people like Herring had success and their work being purchased um so can you talk a little bit more about the about what you discovered about when people were diagnosed publicly when artists during that time were diagnosed publicly, like Robert Maplethorpe or Keith Haring, um, how that affected their, uh, the sale of their work or, uh, you referenced in the film that it was a really hard moment for Keith Haring, for example. Can you elaborate a little bit on that, either of you? Uh, I mean, it's really, I don't know any more about it than what Gracie said in, in really in that moment. Um, mm -hmm. And we didn't, I, I don't know how, like, you know, how it affected sort of, other, the, the market for other people or anything like that. I was surprised, you know, I, I was, when she said that, it, I mean, it totally made sense um, for sure. And I mean, I can imagine that happening even now, any opportunity someone has to like lead the, uh, the legacy of someone else. I'm sure they'll do it. Um, all right. So the final one for both of you is, uh, you know, you're living with this transgressive artist for, a couple of years of your life, I'm sure it's changed the way that you sort of see the world and see artists, if, you know, like all our subjects do. Um, and piggybacking on the on the comment earlier about the whole Lil Nas controversy, and we're still having the Satan conversations, and we're still having the what about the children. Um, where do you both see uh, transgressive queer art in the way that David made it now? And where do you see it going or, or what is something that you might have learned about it or a, a different way that you see art now, transgressive art, the way that David made? 
Um, uh, well, you know, I mean, I think what one of the the big things of David's legacy is this idea of putting yourself in your work. And if, you know, the work we make as artists doesn't contribute to the resistance, it's helping a system of control become more perfect. And I think that um, especially for people that are disenfranchised or, you know, on the edge, whether it's black or brown, queer, whatever it is, when you're putting yourself in your work and you're putting it out there and it's, it's an education. I mean, you are showing people how, you know, your thoughts and how we live. And I think that's, it does make a difference. And I think it's, you know, incredibly important more now than ever. And, um, you know, I think that you have to push the edge, you know, I think it is about being loud and, and, um, you know, abrasive to get your point across. It's like when he was talking about, um, act up and he said, you know, I wish they would get a little more violent about it because that's the only thing people listen to. Yeah. And I also think too, like he talks about like the, he talks about, you know, the gum on the sidewalk, you know, it, mm-hmm. you, have to, you have to, you know, one person spits their gum out on the sidewalk, everybody can walk around it, but you know, a hundred people do it, a thousand people do it. Now, you know, the city and the government has to respond. And I think there's art can do that. And social media allows us to all have a little piece of gum too, if we really, really need it. So thank you very much. Yeah. Well, thanks to all of you. This was a really um, wonderful conversation. Thank you so much, Leo. I have a a question for all of you before we say goodbye, but before that, I just wanted to make um, two comments. Um, You know, I I came of age right around this time. I I was entering my teenage years in the early nineties. And I, I just remember how, overwhelming and compelling and, um, and, and, and com- completely chaotic that time was for a young gay boy in the suburbs, um, Cardinal O'Connor and, and the whole NEA controversy and ACT UP. And I just wanted to commend both of you for um, creating that world. Leo mentioned this, you guys talked about a little bit about this earlier, but um, you know, we're, we're, we are, a lot is the same, but a lot has changed. And I kind of was imagining 18 year olds watching this film having zero understanding or comprehension uh, about what that time was like. So I really wanted to commend you guys on that. And um, in hearing you talk about all of the audio um, that you were working with, um, the, the moment for me that was so powerful in the film was when you used Pat's answering machine message to interrupt uh, David shouting about politics, mm-hmm. two completely different audio sources that created this unreal conflict between these two characters. And I wanted to just just ask you about that one moment, where, where that inspiration came from, where that light bulb came, you know, turned on. Um, you know, it was a lot of things just kind of helped happen sub, sort of subconsciously, I think. And, and like, it, we definitely had to get out of the moment. And, you know, we it was one of those things where um, that was definitely a piece, like we had to get into the family and we had to introduce Pat. And it seemed like in the midst of, you know, David's rant seemed like a perfect moment. And the fact that her voice is so soft. Um, and I think we had used, we, we had already used some of her answering machine stuff later and we had already played around with it. So we kind of knew what it felt like in the cut. Um, but definitely like the, the fact that she was just like this soft little voice, it was like the most disruptive thing in this disruptive um, story. And it felt very real, you know, like David's off dealing with, you know, AIDS and all this stuff. And then there's just like little, you know, family um, connection that, you know, someone who doesn't understand what's going on, doesn't even know what's going on. Um, again, felt very relatable to what people deal with, whether it's AIDS or coming out or whatever is going on in their life, this sort of like tug of war. I'm um, even later when she talked, you know, he talks about the, um, their diagnosis and, and she calls and he's like, I don't know how, you know, telling her that, that he was HIV positive and, and, and like alluding to the sex he had had and all that stuff. And you can hear, and there, there may have been more on that in his tape as well that we didn't include, but like, there, there, he is struggling. Like, of course, David Wojnarowicz is not ashamed of anything, but there is kind of a shame because it's his sister, and he's mm-hmm. like, you know, I don't think, I don't think he even wanted to broach the sex thing. It wasn't so much that he felt bad about having it, but like, you know. yeah, she didn't, like she didn't need to know, perhaps. Yeah, it was such a subtle, simple choice, but it really um, magically. 
created these characters and brought them to life. So I just, I, I loved that moment. Um, before we say goodbye, I wanna hear from all three of you about uh, what, what's happening next. What are you working on next? So maybe let's uh, start with Leo, then Dave, then Chris. Leo, what, what have you got coming up? Um, I'm doing the follow-up to Fathers, which has a sequence that takes place. I, and I did the film in, I wrote the film in 2015 and, it, and there's a sequence that takes place in the nightclub called The Quarantine. Uh -huh. and so I'm going to be, and it's a nightclub that you go in and then you get a, a prophylactic that's poppers. <laughs> and we cure every uh, STI known to man. Uh -huh. So I'm going to be diving into a, sort of a post-COVID world, what the, the Fathers universe would, how it would deal with a pandemic. And that'll be in, in book and film form. And also folks can follow me on Instagram at Herrera Images for my writings. And Dave? Um, I'm continuing on uh, second season of House, uh, Real Housewives of Salt Lake City for Bravo. So completely different than uh -huh. <laughs> David Boyarovich, completely, but um, it's fun as well. But still with a lot of the same raw, you know, anger and energy. Oh, and rage and <laughs> very Just complicated. Lots, yeah. lots of yelling, but what does it all mean? Who can say? And Chris, what's next for you? Um, hopefully uh, vaccinations mm -hmm. in real life. And um, I'd love to open up a franchise uh, of the quarantine when Leo gives me permission. So people can come in and get their uh, <laughs> daily dose of poppers. <laughs> Deal. Well, I hope to one day see all of you guys in person within six feet of one another in, in New York. So um, perhaps that day will come and, and I'd love to welcome you to Film Forum when you're here um, and, it's, and it's safe to have you back. So thanks again for being with us. It's an incredible film and, um, and I commend the both of you for, for making it. And Leo, thank you. This was really, really great. Thank you very much. Bye, it's gentlemen. Fun. Thank you. Bye. Bye. I'd also like to thank Kino Lorber, especially Nick Kemp and David Nin, the centers, Richard Morales, and everyone on the Film Forum staff who helped put this event together, especially Adam Walker and Sonia Chung. If you've yet to see Voynarovich, fuck you, faggot, fuck, fucker, please visit our website, filmforum.org. Our virtual cinema platform presents a dynamic selection of premieres, including documentaries, world cinema, and American independence, as well as restored classics. Stay connected to us through our email newsletter and our social media handle Film Forum NYC on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. We will keep you up to date with additions to our virtual cinema roster and our upcoming virtual events. And finally, please visit us on West Houston Street starting this Friday, April 2nd. Tickets are now on sale for in-person theatrical screenings at our website, filmforum.org. Thank you again for being with us tonight, and we wish you health and happiness. Good evening. <laughs>